Today, we are gonna make some grass. No, I'm not in Colorado, so it's not gonna be that kind of grass. It's our techniques that are so simple and sensible, your models have practically built Stir themselves. <laughs> Well, folks, it's Mad Dog Merv, and today, well, we are taking the blazer out on another little excursion. We're going to try and get the tires dirty, get a little bit of uh, dirt road here and there. We're going to a place called Yosepa, and it is a little ghost town out in the desert of Utah. We'll tell you the whole story about it here in a moment. I decided to take the scenic route out of town trying to follow some of the original Lincoln Highway and do some investigating there. So kind of getting a two for one out of this deal. So Yosepa is a ghost town in Skull Valley. It's located approximately 75 miles southwest of Salt Lake City in the Tooele County area. It was once home to over 200 Polynesian members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yosepa was inhabited during the period of 1889 to 1917. I decided to follow some of the Lincoln Highway and go over what's called Johnson's Pass, which we'll talk about another time, and come in through the south end of Skull Valley. So this is by a place called Dugway, and looking off in the distance, the mountains, uh, way off in the distance there, is uh, our goal get down there to the area where Yosepa is. So starting in 1850, uh, Mormon missionaries were sent to the Polynesian Islands and many of them decided to gather in Utah with the main body of the church. Some were restricted by laws, particularly those in Hawaii. In 1870 the Hawaiian government began to allow immigration and by 1889 some 75 native Hawaiians had gathered in the northern Salt Lake City neighborhood near Warm Springs Park. And this is a picture of Beck's Hot Springs, which is just a little bit further north than that Warm Springs area, but you kind of get the idea. And it wasn't too far from downtown. Despite their common faith, the immigrants experienced significant culture shock as well as, well, some prejudice by the white majority in the area. And it was just part of the way things were back in those days. The Polynesians were barred from staying in white-owned hotels and were refused service in restaurants in Salt Lake City. So church leaders began searching for a location to set aside as a Hawaiian settlement. In 1889, a group of three Hawaiian converts and three returned missionaries were assigned to choose a location. After considering possibilities in Cache County, Weber County, and Utah counties, they selected a 1920-acre site in Skull Valley, known as the Quincy Ranch, or the Rich Ranch, as a gathering place for the South Sea Islanders. The colony was organized as a joint stock company, the Yosepa Agricultural and Stock Company, owned by the LDS Church. The first 46 settlers arrived in the new town site on August 28th of 1889 and drew lots for land. August 28th was later designated as Hawaiian Pioneer Day. The name Yosepa, a Hawaiian form of Joseph, was chosen in honor of Joseph F. Smith who lived from 1838 to 1918. He was one of the first missionaries in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to serve in the Hawaiian Islands. The name Joseph F. Smith might be familiar to you from one of my other videos that I did on the tunnels of West High School. And the reason that was significant is uh, President Smith lived right across the street from the old main building of the uh, what at one point was West High School 
and this was the home that he had there on uh, 100 North right across from the uh, West High School which was uh, on that campus in 1900 so yeah uh, that's where you've probably heard his name before in one of my videos you know, Seppa was an inhospitable location for any group of people. Most of the colonists were from Hawaii, though others were from different parts of Polynesia, and Skull Valley is desert. I mean, it, <laughs> the reason it's called Skull Valley, folks. Um, quite unlike those beautiful islands that they came from, the Yosepans worked hard to improve their new home and eke out a living. The company purchased a sawmill and built homes, a church, a school, and a store. They also developed an extensive irrigation system to bring water from the Stansbury Mountains, allowing fields, lawns, and flower beds to be watered in the middle of the desert. The people planted crops, raised pigs, and even constructed a pond for raising carp and trout. They did their best to adapt and replace traditional foodstuffs not native to Utah, substituting a mixture of flour and cornstarch for poi. In 1899, residents of other parts of the state converged on Yosepa for an Arbor Day celebration in which they planted 300 walnut trees, 300 fruit trees, and 100 ornamental trees. The town became known for its neat streets lined with yellow roses, and in 1911 even won the state prize for the best kept and most progressive city in the state of Utah. While the settlement was well planned, it's considered an unsuccessful attempt at colonization. Yosepa never managed to become self-sufficient. The Latter-day Saint leaders had to allocate church funds to pay the town's expenses. The harsh environment was hard on Yosepan's health. Infectious diseases took a heavy toll, including deaths from pneumonia, smallpox, and diphtheria. In 1896, there were even three cases of leprosy, and a pest house was built outside of town to isolate the lepers. Sensationalized newspaper reports of the outbreak alienated Yosepa even further from the mainstream Utah society. Times became harder after several crop failures, and many of the men sought work as miners in the nearby gold and silver mines. Yosepa continued to grow despite all these challenges. The population increased from around 80 in 1901 to 228 at its peak in 1915. Most residents were Hawaiians, but there were also Samoans, Maoris, Portuguese, Scots, and Englishmen. As you can see from my videos and photos, it was a very beautiful area, but not the kind of place you'd want to try and eke out an existence at all. In the wintertime, just too cold, and in the summertime, just too blasted hot. In 1915, now President Joseph F. Smith of the church announced plans to construct a temple in Lei, Hawaii the first such temple to be outside of the continental United States. The Hawaiian temple brought Yosepa to an end. Although Mormon leaders did not advise the Yosepans to emigrate to Hawaii, the church did offer to pay passage for any who wished to move back home, but could not afford it. Most of Yosepa residents chose to return to Hawaii. By January of 1917, Yosepa was a ghost town, and the land was sold to the Deseret Livestock Company little remains of the original town other than this cemetery and the fire hydrant. In 1971 the Yosepa Cemetery was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. For many years Yosepa has been known for the rows of evenly spaced fire hydrants poking through the sagebrush. Back in 2004 all that remained of the town were a few building foundation and the markers in the town's graveyard which is surrounded by a chain-link fence. A historical marker gives a brief history of the settlement. In 1980, a Memorial Day activity was organized at Yosepa, where a few Utah Polynesian families, some descendants from Yosepans, repaired the fence and beautified the graveyard area. This marked the beginning of an annual tradition that continues to grow. In the mid-1980s, the Yosepa Historical Association was incorporated to foster appreciation for Utah's Polynesian heritage and history. The association works to preserve the town site and organize the festival. On August 28, 1989, Yosepa's centennial, President Gordon B. Hinckley of the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints dedicated a monument at the cemetery 
featuring a bronze bust of a Polynesian warrior. That year, the Memorial Day celebration was transformed from a one-day work activity to an elaborate three-day weekend luau. Every Memorial Day weekend, hundreds of Polynesians and those interested in Polynesian history, about a thousand people, gather at the site for the celebration. Restrooms and a large concrete pavilion were added in 1999, and the association has plans for further improvements to welcome the growing crowds. Camping is encouraged, and visitors are always welcome. Well, I hope you folks like this look at one of the ghost towns here in Utah. We'll be getting out and uh, doing more in this series of Where in the Blue Blazers Are We?